All right, we're going to begin. Um, I'm just going to introduce the other uh, folks that are up here on the stage. On the far end, we have, uh, on the far left, okay, we have uh, Jason DeRoshi, Dr. Jason DeRoshi, who's Associate Professor of Old Testament and Biblical Theology at Bethlehem College and Seminary. And seated next to me here is Mike Tong, uh, who is a longtime friend and who is the pastor for neighborhood outreach here at Bethlehem at the downtown campus. Um, we decided we wanted to begin to, by letting Mike uh, tell a little story about ho- how hospitality can go wrong. So here's a little story for Mike. So this was about seven years ago. My family and I, I've got three kids, and we were walking through the main hall. We got to the bookstore, made a pit stop, and I ran into a guy I'd never seen before at the downtown campus, another Asian man. So I said, hey, never seen you before. What's your name? I'm Billy. And I said, you know, first time here. He was a college student. And I said, hey, we're about to go to my house having some people over. Why don't you join us for lunch? He says, yeah, that sounds great. So we exchanged numbers. And I said, I'll text you my address. I'm right down the street. Just come on by. He's like, that's great. Sounds good. So texted him, waited about 30 minutes. He never showed up. And I got a text later. And he says, actually, Mike, I decided to go home. Um, just, it's not going to work out this week. That's no problem. I I didn't see him again for four years. Uh, Bethlehem's a pretty big place, but in that time, he became a believer and was heavily involved in our uh, campus outreach ministry here. And uh, one day at Jared Wass's house, Pastor Jared's our uh, pastor for adult adult discipleship, he had a summer training project. And uh, there I, so I was there as the guest speaker and uh, there was Billy. And Billy came up to me and he said, Mike, do you remember me? I said, yeah, I, I totally remember you. You're like the only other Asian guy here at Bethlehem. <laughs> Not really. There's at least 10 of us. Um, and I said, yeah, I was like, man, you never came over to my house. He's like, do you know what? That was my very first time ever in a Christian church. I wasn't a believer. I didn't know what Christians were. And I was afraid that if I went to your house, I thought you were going to kill me. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I really, I was going to kill him, so I mean, <laughs> that, that's just a joke, camera. Um, but, what, you know, in all seriousness, one thing that that points out is the ordinary, just having someone over, inviting a stranger over to your house, is so unpracticed. It's so foreign. You want me to go to your house? Like, there must be, I've, I've watched this movie. I'm going to wind up in a cage in the basement, right? Um, it is an extraordinary thing in our culture to open up a home. So, how do you follow that up? Um, so, here's a somewhat related question, perhaps. Uh, there, there are probably lots of people in our churches who feel under-equipped to have people in their homes. And I like the way that you, you talked about it, Tony, that there's a difference uh, between hospitality and entertaining. Uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of things, how would you encourage families who feel like our place is too small, you know, we don't have enough chairs, or in, in a related way, I'm unmarried, I'm a college student, give some practical advice for, for how those kinds of people can take the baby steps to practice hospitality. Oh, uh, you know, I... I alluded to this a little bit, but doing it with community. Um, so if you have tiny living quarters, um, but you're, you really want to practice hospitality of doing this with your, some people, perhaps in your small group, um, when it comes to like hosting and providing food, I encourage our people who are older by, by saying college students don't care really what the food is normally. It's, it's free. It's somewhat healthy. They're there, you know, like, and you can do paper plates. It, you can throw it in the trash and they can hang out for a couple hours. You can go take your nap. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be, you know, steak and filet. They don't care. So you don't have to think extravagant. That's not what hospitality is about. Um, um, and with that, I would just say one of the important parts of hospitality that I didn't talk about is sometimes unbelievers are more attracted to the Christian community than the Christian gospel at first. And they, they want to see how the gospel works. How, how, how does that work in a marriage, 
How does that work in conflict resolution? How does that work in the use of money? So it's, it's really important, actually, that we do some hospitality with other believers, that they, they get to see the, the body of Christ together, uh, to see some of those distinctions. So I would just say, don't feel like you have to do this all by yourself. Um, yeah. Mike, do you want to? Um, yeah, I really appreciate those principles. Uh, you know, my, my wife and I, we never worry about if, if our house is picked up enough. enough. It's not. <laughs> that, that's just the fact. Uh, we don't worry about if there's enough food or not. Uh, there probably is not going to be. And I remember one of the pastors here, we, we were going to do something called uh, Pixar in the Park. So we bought licenses to show these Pixar movies um, on one of the most troubled corners in the entire state of Minnesota. And uh, summers at 9 p.m. is when we started. And one of the pastors said, how many people are coming? And I said, well, I don't know, 50 to 200? I don't know. And he says, well, how much food are you preparing? And what happens if you run out of food? He says, if we run out of food, people won't eat. That's, the, that's it. That, not, what, what worse is going to happen? So I, I guess, you know, when so I, 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 I want to have people over basically every single day, um, all day long. And my wife, over 12 years of being married now, has uh, slowly come, come around and, and been more open to that. But many of the apprehensions to having people over uh, right away was, you know, do we have a seat for everyone? Um, how much food? Are you getting an RSVP? And for 10 years, I've been trying to kill the very notion of RSVPs when we have hospitality in homes. Um, I, I just view it as friction. I don't want any friction. I want people just to be able to come. And maybe we don't have enough food. But then we have some funny jokes, and those never run out. Yeah. yeah. So... Tony, you mentioned a minute ago here that, um, you know, sometimes when you have unbelievers into your home, they want to see how life operates. How do Christians do life? And as, as you were talking, I was, I was wondering, uh, I had this question I wrote down during your talk. Uh, so they're sitting at the table, now what? Hmm. Um, how do you think about yeah, I sharing think the gospel in that context? What I tend to tell our people is don't be a weird Christian. When they come over to your house... Like, don't turn to them and say, I want to tell you about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> it's like, then they start feeling like that guy. He's going to kill me. This guy, he's going to kill me. I want to live. Uh, like, you save that. Save that for down, down the road, you know. Some of the end times, uh, you know, explanation. Uh, but, you know, just share stories. Share about your life. Um, try to find contact points with the person. Um, do talk about Jesus. Do talk about grace. Um, I like how Tim Keller talks about when he, he talks a lot about um, how to integrate faith and work and how to how to hang out with your coworkers, you know, when work is over. Like he doesn't like this. Let's hide that we're Christians and kind of move it in toward the middle or the end of the relationship. But actually telling them up front um, to to alert them that there is there is a distinction, but also um, to have that out there as a, an eventual talking point of, uh, and, and so you don't have to be really forceful with it, but, and he talks about some practical ways to drip that, to hopefully get them to, to buy in to ask more. And it's, you know, it's, it's more disarming things like mentioning stuff that happened at your church or something that happened at a small group or a book you read and uh, to learn the art of, of kind of throwing it out there, and if they're if they're interacting with it, just go with it. Um, and um, you know, I think we probably get better at that with practice. Um, but also to remember, um, I think God is. I, I've discovered that God is at work in awkward conversations. Like we, we tell our people when it comes to like community, like do awkward conversations a lot. Like, a lot of unresolved conflict is because we won't talk to each other um, in the church. And then with unbelievers, like, it's going to be awkward. Like, yeah, that's, that's awesome, you know. Uh, God tends to show up in, in those moments. And to just embrace that, to, to realize that we're living by faith. Like, 
we really need you, God, to show up because I don't know how to talk to this person and <laughs> I don't know how to get it started. And just jump in, you know. You might be surprised at where it goes. Yeah. So all, all three of you have a range in terms of the age of your children. How have you thought about helping them think about hospitality? You know, um, Jonathan told us a story earlier about, about you, Jason, about when, uh, when he first, you know, came to visit Bethlehem years ago, that he pulled up in the driveway and uh, opened the car door, jumped out, and here your kids came running, never seen him before in their lives, you know, give him a big hug. Uh, I mean, that seems to be a pretty, how, how our, our families operate in welcoming people seems to be pretty important. So how have you, have you guys thought about talking uh, with your kids about that? Well, last night we had one of my college buddies that we graduated in 1995 together, and he came over. He lives in Washington, D.C., and it was, it was a little funny because he comes into our house for spaghetti supper, and he's just here on a business trip, and my kids have never met him. Some of them knew who he was, and they were quiet all around the table. I'm like, are these my kids, <laughs> you know, that we're, we're, we're eating and he's talking and he's, he's trying to pull out of them, um, but doing it, I, I think just doing it, um, I mean, our, our entire journey here um, into, what did you call it, advanced hospitality, whatever it is, um, that, that adoption, our journey of adoption these last seven years, it, I mean, our older three, and then once Ezra came home, he was journeying with us in adopting the twins. It, it's just been, um, it's been a family endeavor. It's not just mom and dad. We've grieved together. Mm -hmm. We've celebrated together. We've prayed together. It, I mean, it's been some of the, uh, some of the deepest suffering that our family has ever endured has been this journey to be able to, to weep together as a family. Uh, for me to be able to guide them and show them uh, this is what it looks like to grieve under the sovereignty of God, to be absolutely trusting in our God and, and weeping together and yet uh, looking to him in dependence. Um, I think where our priorities lie are going to rub off on our kids. Mm -hmm. They're going to see it. Um, over supper, you were mentioning how you as a pastor are, um, you know, you were preaching about hospitality and you're, yet you're looking at your own life and saying, I, I see hypocrisy here and, and the struggle with that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think um, even for me, I, I feel like, I, I don't know if I should be up here on this stage. I just, I don't feel like I'm the greatest leader in this process. And... Um, and yet I see the Lord is doing something in our hearts and what's happening in my wife and me is spilling off. I can see it happening in my kids. I can see what they're prioritizing, what they're talking about, um, what they're desiring. And so, so it, I, I think it's just a matter of living it out, um, letting our kids participate in our own struggles, in our own questions, in our own fears, and in our own faith. Hmm. Yeah. You want to add to that? Um, uh, frankly, our kids love, uh, our kids love having parties. They love having people over. Mostly look forward to it. Probably the part that has needed the most shepherding is when it comes to the breakage of their toys or the interruption <laughs> of their bedroom systems, you know, like, what about my Legos? Don't, I don't want them to touch my Legos, Dad. Because, you know, my son's got this million-piece Lego collection and it's all on his shelf. And uh, it, it reminds me, when we first moved to, to our house, we got a brand-new dining room table. And I was like, we were saying, this is for the Lord, right? <laughs> well, then these the girls, these college girls came over, and they had a party, and I'm not sure what happened, but I came home. We weren't even there. Came home, and there was a huge scratch. And, and that, that was an audible word from the Lord, like, 
whose table is this? Because I was like, <laughs> my table. Uh, and it, it was really good it's for me to say, you know, this, I, I, I love this table more than I should. And uh, so I want to try to help my children. And I say regularly to them, uh, your Legos are just stuff. This is a person that broke it. And we should love the person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a leather, leather ottoman that is ripped, has a big hole in it because of someone who was in our house. And we could patch it up. And I was like, no, let's leave it. Like, I want people to know, and our kids especially, that this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. People are going to stain your carpet. They're going to mess up your furniture. They're going to make a mess in your bathroom. Like, that goes with the territory, man. Like, it's okay. Like, it's stuff, you know. Um, and it's, it's easier to say than, you know, embrace. Um, and, but it's, I think our kids are watching how the gospel works in hospitality. We really are teaching through, you know, some of these experiences. So one of the questions I have, especially living in the context that, we live in here in the neighborhood is how to think wisely about doing hospitality in the urban context when sometimes we have neighbors who are dangers who are dangers yeah and so h- how have you thought about about that Great you know, I live in a, uh, a a block where my next door neighbors um, are regularly level three sex offenders. Hmm. And I want to be an encouragement to mm-hmm. them. I want to uh, hope that God is in fact at work in their lives. Mm-hmm. But I also have to think about the other people who live in this house. Absolutely. The other people who live on this block. So how help me think about how to do hospitality in that context. Yeah. And, and Mike, I mean, if you want to share a little bit more, even from your chapel message about some of the challenges you guys have faced, you know, in maybe not having, you know, thought those things through to the degree maybe that you needed to at the beginning. So just some, some help on that. Yeah, so um, at our church and in, in, in our family, I'm known as the mercy guy. My wife's known as justice girl. So my wife is. She um, wear a cape and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and she's very attractive. But anyway, um, the uh, <laughs> uh, she does a lot of work with anti-trafficking, and she's, you know, advocates for the vulnerable and she got a military background, uh, you know, her, her dad's retired army. So she's, she has a real justice nerve. So we live right in front of the high school and kids are smoking weed just on the other side of the street uh, off on the school property. And, and she calls police, you know, like she's, she's justice. If somebody's speeding, she gets her license plate, calls it, you know, like, um, so she is, she's got a real sensitivity to danger, you know, um, where, and that's important. I, and even in the talk on orphan care, like there has to be a lot of wisdom in how we do orphan care. Um, in our zeal sometimes to do compassion, we can do some very unwise things. So I think we always want to temper compassion with, with wisdom. So that's just the principle, right? How, like how you do it is really on a case-by-case basis, I think. But again, I don't want to restrict hospitality to simply the home. Like there, it's really the spirit of hospitality, right? It's the how to do neighbor love. And I'm not going to bring in that offender into my house with three girls. But there, there are ways I can minister to those neighbors and, and still practice hospitality without putting people at risk, I think. Um, and just to be sensible about it. You know, Steve Timmis, I mentioned in the sermon, he's, he's notorious for having so many people in his house, and he doesn't even know who's in there sometimes. Uh, and... He he brought home a guy who just got released from prison, and um, he actually told his daughter to put her dresser in front of the door at night and <laughs> all this stuff, and made some rules with this guy. Hey, you can't be here when if I'm not here, you have to leave when I leave, and um, things like that. So I think it's case by case, but you have to you do need to take that into consideration, especially in the urban context. Um, so I don't want to restrict it to homes. I want to say be sensitive, um, beware. Um, don't check your brain at the door, um, uh, but don't let it stop you. I don't think we can let the danger stop us from real serious neighbor love, you know? Yeah, and that's where, you know, you mentioning earlier, uh, you don't have to think this out all by yourself. Right. You know, do, do hospitality as a community. You, you, can, you can brainstorm ways to get mm-hmm. the whole block together or to yeah. do 
those kinds of activities where you can um, be wise mm -hmm. and yet still be open-hearted to, mm -hmm. to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, probably the highlight for me of what you just brought to us, which was a great blessing to me, was your home is not your refuge. Jesus is your refuge. And I would say yes and amen to the extreme. Um, if it costs you your home, Jesus is still your refuge. And I just, that, I resonate with that so much. Um, and uh, I have a 100-pound wife and three little kids whose safety and nourishment depends on me not checking my brain at the door. And um, so he, he, here's an example. We had Holy Week worship. Worship every night of Holy Week at our house just ended with, you know, with Good Friday, obviously. And um, it was Wednesday night. There was 50 people crammed in the living room. We were singing songs. All the windows were open. And at the end of the last song, we heard, woo, yeah. And I walked to the door and I see this guy. I can't even see his face, but he's just on the sidewalk. And he's like, man, are you in there alone or are there other people in there with you? And so everyone is listening to this guy hollering. And it's kind of like, okay, what am I going to say now? It's, it's about 9 o'clock at night. And do I say, come on in? Or do I say, yeah, we're worshiping the Lord. And you should stay on the sidewalk because I don't know who you are. <laughs> right? What do you say? <laughs> There's no good choice here. So I say, come on in, you know. And uh, I have no idea, zero idea who I've just invited <laughs> into my house. Um, another time, we were doing premarital counseling. It was 1030 at night. And we're in our living room. Our kids are sleeping. We're out, my wife and our on one couch, the other couple's on the other couch. And uh, suddenly I hear someone at the front door. And at the time, no one was living with us. So we're like, what is that? I open the door. So, so now it's the interior part of my house. And there's a lady just standing there in my entryway. And right away, I was like, you need to go onto the porch. And I you know, kind of pushed her out onto the porch, locked the door. And I said, how can I help you? And uh, anyway, so crazy, crazy incidences. But um, it, it's the times when I have... So th there's a friend uh, named Vince, if Daniel's in here. Daniel just called me 7 o'clock this morning and said, Mike, Vince is in our coffee shop, just wondering if you have any help for me. Uh, Vince is uh, in his 50s. He's a Native American man, and he's uh, an alcoholic, and he drinks just, and he gets very, very drunk. And for three months, a few years ago, his wife had pneumonia, so he stopped drinking while he attended to her at the hospital. And in those three months, uh, he and I became very close. He's over at my house. Um, he put together the trampoline in the backyard for our kids. He had dinner with our family multiple times. And uh, when his wife started getting better, she went out of the hospital. He started drinking again. And, um, you know, he would, he, he would come over drunk. And uh, he really scared my wife really badly. In fact, I, I've never seen really anybody exhibiting such fear, shaking fear as my wife when Vince would come banging on our door drunk in the middle of the night. And um, as a result, uh, we are, we're, we're going to be moving. We've been in our neighborhood for uh, 11 years now and we'll be moving out of our neighborhood. I'm the neighborhood outreach pastor here at Bethlehem, and I, I think it's wisest for us to move out of the house because um, having not thought carefully about the use of my house in hospitality, I have spoiled uh, some of the key factors of a home. Now, mm -hmm. yes, a home is a wonderful ministry tool for hospitality. Mm -hmm. Yes and amen, absolutely. Right, your home is not your refuge. Mm -hmm. Christ is your refuge. Yet, a home primarily must be the place of protection and nourishment of your family. Mm -hmm. And if you jeopardize that, you jeopardize everything below it, mm -hmm. including hospitality. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done. And I'm not thrilled with that. Um, but I feel like I've learned. And I hope you all can learn 
from that as well. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So maybe <clears throat> to transition a little bit from that, Mike, um, one of the questions I had for, for you, Tony, at the, at the beginning of your book, you talk about um, how it was being called essentially to teach on the poor, on caring for the poor, that really catalyzed this change in your and your wife's life. I mean, having to deal with the, with the text mm -hmm. uh, in caring for the poor. Talk a little bit about that transition in your all's life and maybe some of the successes and, and failures yeah. uh, along the way. That's a long story. I'll, I'll try to go fast and short. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was invited to speak at a youth conference. They said, we want you to do a Bible study on the poor. And so I just started. I thought this would be a great week of youth camp. I'll read some verses, tell some stories, and we'll take up an offering. You know, it'll be a great week. Um, and what I did not anticipate was that the Lord would just use this personal study to reorient our whole lives, essentially, as I began to see God's consistent concern with the orphan, the widow, the stranger, the poor, the, the texts that were quoted this morning. And as I was teaching the students and adults that were present, hey, we need to care for orphans, I couldn't name an orphan. And, uh, you know, I was never against orphan care. I, nobody... No one's against caring for the poor, the orphan, the widow. Like, no, we want to see them suffer, you know. We're not going to say that. But we, but can you name one? Like, what have you done? And I was haunted by that. And I got convicted by my own preaching. It was like, as I was preaching, it was miserable. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to repent. Like, I need, I can hang on for a second. I need to, to pray uh, in the middle of the sermon. So anyway, I, I went back to Kimberly and I said, baby, like, this is what's going on. And we'd been married five years. We had a big house. We were living in New Orleans. And I said, uh, I want some kids. And she's like, well, how do you want to get them? And I was like, well, I, I think there are two ways. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I think we ought to think about adoption. And, and so she was a little bit behind me in saying yes, not too much. And then she was like, so where do you want to get the kids from? And, and as an old baseball player, naturally, I said, Dominican Republic. That's where I want to get them from. I'd like to get like nine of them, uh, you know. <laughs> And he's going to dominate Little League, and it's going to be fantastic. And little Miguel is going to be out there in the backyard. And, uh, she's like, that's a horrible motivation. And uh, I was like, okay. So we, we set our sights on Ukraine. I'd been there teaching some. Um, she wanted two little girls from Eastern Europe, and we ended up with four. We went, went to get two, came back with four. Uh, that's our story. It's a sibling group of four. So we went from zero to four. And then after uh, about a year, we decided we had room for one more, and my sister has five adopted children from Ethiopia, and my, my kids have been playing with their cousins. And so uh, they kept saying, James kept saying, me want they brother, me want they brother. And I was like, well, where do you want us to, to go? You want us to go back to Ukraine? And, and he had been playing with his cousins, and he said, no, me want they sunscreen brother. Me want they sunscreen brother. <laughs> and I was like, you mean a suntan brother? Yeah, me want they suntan brother. <laughs> and so uh, we, we um, searched for... It, through Ethiopia, found Joshua's biological parents died when he was one, and he had no siblings. Had an uncle put him in an orphanage, and um, he's brought us great joy. Um, but it really was just my study of the text, my study of the need around the world, and just a simple question. Like I don't, I don't put this on people. Like every Christian should adopt kids. What I say is every Christian should want to imitate God. Like. Ephesians 1, 5, you've been adopted. Ephesians 5, 1, imitate God. 1, 5, 5, 1. And, and so the question is, how can we do this? God is an adoptive father. And, and how, how can we put his adopting love on display before a broken world? That answer is going to be different for everybody. And not all the kids are available for adoption around the world. So th there, have to be, there has to be a more holistic orphan care that we have to do. But it all started just with my own study and the spirit working in my life, I think, it wasn't because it was trendy or because I heard a, a guy talk about it as much as it was just, man, th this is a blind spot in my life. And I came out of a particular wing of evangelicalism that was scared of mercy, ministry, and compassion in fear that it would lead us into the social gospel and we would abandon proclamation. And I heard a, a lot of that. I still hear a lot of that. And I just want to say, no, neighbor love is on my side. <laughs> I don't have to play defense. Um, loving your neighbor is never wrong. Like, um, let's do it wisely. Uh, but let's be about showing compassion in, in word and deed. Um, and I also just add with the orphan care 
ministry is that we're really not doing orphan care if we don't do proclamation. Like we're really not loving people if we don't do evangelism. So we don't have to put these two against each other. We just need to cultivate a heart of love for this broken world and, and ask the Lord to use us as agents of redemption uh, in whatever way we, we can be used. But that, that's where it all began for us. I know that, that both of you, having adopted kids, have thought a lot about what the Bible has to say to us about the widow and the orphan. And your own experience in adopting uh, children has, I think, at least the way that I've heard you talk about it over the years, has um, in some ways uh, illumined or deepened the, the realities of um, our adoption as sons of God, you know, the, the kind of imagery uh, bringing it home in that way. Um, for, for lots of people, maybe many people in this audience, um, adoption right now might not be adopting children at the moment I mean, is, is not an option um, or might not be an option. There are other ways that one can be involved in caring for orphans, mm -hmm. but I think sometimes we don't think about what those are. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that. I know that that's something you and Teresa have been thinking about too in terms of your long-term investment in Ethiopia. So maybe talk about some ways that the church can be involved in orphan care, even if we can't adopt a child at the moment. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's another big answer. Um, I think, <clears throat> so at, at one level, I think we just need to care for the functionally fatherless that's all around us. Like this has been called the fatherless generation. You know, every school has the functionally fatherless. They may have parents, but they're, they're functionally fatherless. Um, so beginning to, to be sensitive to that snotty-nosed kid down the street who just seems to be by himself all the time. Um, that's a place to start. Anybody can start there. To uh, look at your local foster care agency. To really befriend and minister to those who are working in foster care is also a great ministry. That's a very thankless job. Those people are exhausted. It's a, like, show hospitality to foster care workers <laughs> uh, would be a great way to just bless them, you know. Um, we've adopted the uh, field office for international justice mission in the Dominican Republic. And, and one of the ways IJM has said we can help the, their ministry is simply giving respite to those workers, to bringing them home for retreats and just blessing the workers. So I think if you're not in an orphan care ministry or you're not, adopt, or not adopting, just look at people who are involved in it and try to encourage them, like babysit for adoptive parents. Um, um, tutoring, that's a huge need for our family. And we've been blessed by so many uh, gifted, intelligent uh, college students and graduate students because our kids have real academic challenges, um, teaching them how to, how to write and, and read. Um, so uh, I would just say, when it comes to mercy ministry, compassion in general, I would just look at your life and say, what am I good at? Not, not in a braggadocious way, but like, what, what am I gifted at? And how can I leverage it for the good of, of those in need? Even your vocation, you know, like, um, we often say, like, you don't have to leave your vocation to do ministry. You need to leverage your vocation. So if you're a farmer, like, how can you help kids around the world develop a sustainable life by, by farming? Just one quick example. We, we support an orphanage in Uganda, and we, we work with, with uh, orphanages that, we have a, a local pastor on the ground that gives us reports and is caring for the kids. So we brought this pastor into our church, uh, Jeffrey, and he was going small group to small group, sharing what he was doing in these orphanages. And these, these little orphans, are they're in these little homes with a, a widow that's over each home, little cottage. And he said, our biggest need right now, he's in a small group, and he said, our biggest need is to teach the kids how to do pig farming. And, and I think he said, one, May have said to I think it was just one pig per home would would sustain that whole family. They, it grows really big and they sell it, but it's a, it's a it's a simple way to have a to, for them to to survive. And we had a, a guy, a deacon in our church, Jay, who's like in his fifties, who was a pig farmer for twenty plus years, and he's just he's an emotional guy. He is he's the deacon I would die for. You know, like he is awesome, and and he's just wondering. You say, like, I had no, I always wanted to do something. I didn't know 
you know, what I could do. So we had to get Jay a passport. He'd never been overseas. And he goes and he teaches kids how to raise pigs. And uh, he's going next week again. This time he's taking a fish farmer with him to, to teach them how to, how to raise fish. Um, it's that sort of thing. Um, because what they're really doing is not only sustaining orphans, but if they can help that whole region get out of poverty and, and develop sustainable living, they can prevent orphans. And that's another ministry to orphans. Is sometimes orphans are orphans because of poverty and not because of death. And because there's no education, there's no, there's, there's no, there's no vocations for them. And so if we can do some of the work on the front end, you know, that would help. So again, there are so many ways we can do holistic orphan care. Um, but I would just kind of start with your own neighborhood. If you take the Good Samaritan story as a, as a model, if we could do that, who, who's the dying man in your road? Like, we can't do everything. We can't eradicate every world problem. That uh, Jesus will do that. But like, what can we do? And what is in front of us? And what are we good at? You know, let's do that. In Scripture, even though some of the translations render it orphan, the term in the Bible is fatherless. Mm -hmm. Fatherless. And all of a sudden, if you bring that into our contemporary society, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And even if you're not engaged in adoption, to pray for eyes to see the need, where you can come in and help a single mom, where you can befriend a young child and mentor. Mm -hmm. And then, like Tony was saying, um, the poverty challenge is not going to be overcome by handouts. Relief work mm -hmm. is not where the need is. Mm -hmm. The need is in development. Mm -hmm. For people to come in to these majority world cultures and love and befriend. James just says, visit Visit the orphan and the widow in their distress. That's pure religion. And, and we might think we've got we've to have a plan. We've got to have a program. Just, just visit. Get to know them. Learn their name. Learn their story. And share them the love of Christ. And anybody can do that. You don't have to have any degree, any level of education to care and to minister the love of Jesus. But then if you have skill, oh, the doors are wide open. Uh, if you feel like there's nowhere I can serve here, um, man, overseas, they will just embrace, embrace the opportunity for you to come and share your skill, share your love. You don't have to go long term. You could go short term. The opportunities are massive. Uh, just, just if you're at this church, come and talk to, to um, our our GO team, our uh, global outreach team, short-term ministry team, learn about the opportunities and just say, okay, I don't know. I, I, I'm a school teacher. I'm a hog farmer. Uh, I'm a well driller. I'm an electrician. Is there any way you could use me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. The needs are great. Mm -hmm. um, but the key is just are you willing to love? Are you willing to listen? To learn my story, people, to image God rightly, people need to have an identity, an opportunity to display God's glory through their thinking, through their doing, to feel like I have a purpose. I am here to glorify the living God, and most of the world is, is broken and empty because they have no sense of purpose. They have no sense of personhood. They don't recognize that they are created in order to display the greatness of God in every aspect. And, and we have the opportunity, because we know this Jesus, to simply befriend them. Let them know, yes, I care about you. You're a person worth knowing. And give them a sense of identity. And, and with that will come hope, opportunity to share the gospel. Um, To just be yourself and be a friend is enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would just add that idea of looking for those in your church whom God has called into adoption and seeing how you can help them. Mm -hmm. 
Our family, oh man, I could just list the names of those who have just stepped in to bless, to befriend, to aid in tutoring, and it matters. Mm -hmm. It matters so much. And, you know, to give a dad and a mom a date night, mm -hmm. um, to just do it once, mm -hmm. unbelievable, just, just to give that opportunity, you can do that. And it matters. Absolutely. Can I share a story about, yeah. you know, defining orphans as fatherless? We have a ministry at the downtown campus, uh, the Phillips Club for Children and Youth. They meet at one of the local parks. And what they do is they have an after-school club for the kids. But really, that's just a hub for building relationships with them. And after the kids are brought into the club and they have a mentor assigned to them, we try to pick them up for church and bring them here. Well, th there's this one particular mentor that brought their Phillips Club. So this is a kid who I, I don't know their whole story, but they're hanging out at the park. Some of these kids are told, even when they're as young as five, you can't come home until the park closes. So the parents kind of use the park as free child care. So these are the kids that are coming to the Phillips Club. And uh, one mentor brought their kid, their mentee, to church and brought them to the youth group. And here's a story about God being after people. This, this kid from the Phillips Club that has no connection to Bethlehem comes to the youth group and he goes downstairs and lo and behold, he says to his mentor, that's my brother and sister. And it turns out his brother and sister, blood brother and sister, were adopted by a Bethlehem family a decade earlier. And he hadn't seen them. And here they were reunited in our basement. One, adopted by a family. Literally into a Bethlehem family and now into the family of God. And their third sibling, God is still after them and bringing them through different means. Well, maybe to, uh, to wrap up. Jason, earlier today, it was really helpful. Uh, you were preaching from Deuteronomy 10 and the command, the calling to love the sojourner flowing out of God's love for his people, the God who executes justice and who demonstrates his faithfulness. And as we think about living in this city where there are lots and lots of sojourners, you know, we, we're the number four gateway city in the U.S., you know, we have 75, 80,000 maybe uh, Somali neighbors now in the Twin Cities. And to our knowledge, none, no, no church, right? Uh, very few who know Jesus. Um, there, there are just so many opportunities that we as a church in this uh, area um, have to demonstrate neighbor love. Um, especially, I, I thought maybe, Mike, a way we could end would be just for you to talk about some ways, because of your unique kind of positioning as the downtown neighborhood outreach pastor, just the kinds of things that you see around us that you can encourage people who are sitting here tonight to, to go home and pray about uh, and to, to, in their small group, say, hey, you know, we could, you know that the Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services is here in the Twin Cities, or World Relief is here. We could go meet a refugee family at the airport and, and help them get settled and take them to the grocery store. So just things, things like that so that we could, you know, kind of practical steps, little steps that we could take even out of this time uh, together tonight to think about how to follow Jesus in that way. Well, the theme of the night is ordinary, and I, I really appreciate that. And I would just beat the same drum. So hand me the drumstick, <laughs> and I'll say, bring them to your house. Um, build a relationship with the neighbor on purpose. Identify yourself early as a Christian, as with Christ, and build a relationship with them. Um, very practically, say for our context here in the Twin Cities, perhaps there's no way for you to build a relationship with a refugee, someone who was displaced from their homeland, living, perhaps even born in a refugee camp in another country, and received asylum here in the United States. And now they're here, how do I meet them? 
Um, very, very practically, that's the key word here. There's a ministry here that is an arm. You called it World Relief earlier. Here in Minnesota, they have renamed themselves as Arrive Minnesota. And the particular arm that they work with is Refugee Life Ministries, RLM. And you can contact them. We have regular contact with RLM. And your small group or a group of small groups or just friends that you have, you can essentially adopt a family that's coming. They will tell you the arrival time. Uh, and you can get their uh, apartment set up, fill their refrigerator. Um, imagine if I, if you were to get on a plane with me right after this, and we were to fly to my parents' homeland, Taiwan, together, and then I disappeared, what would you do? What would you do? Literally, what, what would your next step be? Let's say you didn't even have any cash, and you didn't speak any Chinese. What would you do? How wonderful would it be mm-hmm. if some... English-speaking, brothers and sisters were to come along and say, let me help you find your way here in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. It would mean everything to you. We can be that Mm -hmm. for people that aren't coming from a rich background, but coming out of poverty, death, destruction. And uh, RLM helps connect men and women like you with men and women that are coming from refugee camps. Mm -hmm. That's one real practical way. Well, before I, I'm going to ask you to pray for us and close our night out here. But uh, before I do, why don't you help me thank uh, Tony and uh, Jason and Mike for uh, being here this evening. Father, we praise you that you... We, we just praise you that you are one who loves the small things. That you entered in while we were weak, while we were still sinners. You set a banqueting table before us and said, come. You let us enjoy the king's feast. I pray that we would not restrict others from enjoying the table, but would have overflowing hearts seeing how lavish you have loved us, how lavishly, and may it move us to be good lovers. Lovers of the broken, lovers of the weak, lovers of the oppressed. Change our hearts. Work in us what is pleasing in your sight to the glory of your Son, for the fame of your name, for the expansion of your kingdom. For our joy. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this evening. There is still a book table out back. We'd love to have you visit that and uh, take a look at some of the books that that we have recommended and and Tony's book, certainly. Uh, Tony's going to be here for a while afterwards as well. If you'd like to to meet him, uh, please please do do that. And uh, thanks again so much for, for being here. Have a good night.